Now it's Halloween. Is it Halloween? Yes? No? Who still has candy left over? No? You gave it all away to the kids, right? Okay. Um, let's get started. Right. So, uh, what was the thing? I had something about logistics. I can't remember. Um, office hours today at 12.30. And uh, something else that I forgot. Well, whatever. The videos are all rolling along as, as usual. Oh, there, oh, that's it. The syllabus. At one point during the, um, the midterm feedback that I asked you guys for, uh, somebody, more than one person said, uh, you know, I wish we could have the notes ahead of time. That was a very common uh, idea, and I already told you how hard that is, because I don't have the notes ahead of time. And the other thing was, uh, you know, what are the topics going to be? And I've been keeping the syllabus up to date as far as the topics that I'm talking about. And when I prepare for a lecture, I look at the four words of a syllabus, and that's almost what I write on this paper. Okay? So in terms of notes ahead of time, you will know ahead of time doing that. And if you, if you really do want to prepare for the lecture, look at the syllabus, go to Wikipedia, look up principal agent, and read that entry. That will get you a start on whatever the, the jargon is. Okay? So um, that might be a hint for people that do want to have some notion before I talk about it, what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, with the syllabus, I think you sent out, I don't know if you sent out or the briefing number two, the peer grade, is due on the 8th of December. The grading will be due on the 8th of December. So that's something we have to do. Hand in. Hand in. Because the 8th of December falls into the RRR week. Yeah. Um, so do we just have to send it in by email or um, do we have to come? Because we, we have, have class, class on the 8th of December. We have class? Yeah. We, there's, a there's a lecture, but it's no new material. So oh, okay. you should show up. It'll be like a review session, right? Okay. And we're gonna we might be dunking for apples for all I know. Okay, so um, but I, I I know that there's gonna be no new material there. I already prepared that way when the before the semester okay. began. Um, and if you you know you're all adults, if you want to show up and hand in your your grading on the peer review, that's fine. If you want to walk away after that, that's fine, right? Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other open kinds of questions, stuff? I'm going to get to the briefing grading, which is of interest to some of you in a minute. Any other questions that are not related to that? No? Okay. Um, auction update. The, uh, the auction we ran last, I had a great time spending that $2.75 last week. Wow. It was a party. But um, that, that um, I put the video, the 3.3 minutes and 45 second video, that last all pay auction uh, on my blog and then I sent it to some people that are more famous than me and they posted it and now it has 4,500 views, <laughs> like since Monday, right? So uh, that was pretty cool. I was ecstatic. That might be, you know, one of the best things you ever learned in this class, even though it costs some of your compadres $2.75. Um, but I do, I do want to remind you that that all pay auction is a one, an example of one type of lobbying, uh, and that's what I mentioned. It's the kind where you've got, uh, like the, the, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, that kind of lobbying, where you have two groups that are both, or three or four groups, that are all lobbying the politicians who are sitting there saying, oh yes, give me donations, I'll listen to you. Oh yes, give me donations, I'll listen to you. That's the all pay aspect to it, right? A much more common type of lobbying that we're all used to is when the um, uh, the farmers, let's say, in the corn states that go to their senators and they say, give us money from the other citizens, and the senators say, here you go, right? That kind of lobbying is a typical special interest group lobbying that um, you're talking, you're going to be discussing in your briefing, and also the type of lobbying that um, is much more common, we're much more used to seeing. It's, it's the kind that Wall Street is doing as far as executive compensation. We give you, uh, and somebody actually figured this out at the Department of Agriculture, when um, I think the donation is something like, if you give a dollar to a politician campaign contributions, you get back over $100 of pork, okay, in terms of, dist uh, in terms of just uh, transfers from the general taxpayers to um, those special interests. So um, the reason that lobbying is, is so... Um, 
prevalent is because there's a whole bunch of people that are making a killing off of us, the people. And that's the biggest goal in this, in this briefing, number one, and maybe the biggest goal in this class is to convey to you the importance of this and how it affects our policies, including environmental policies, which many of you care about, including oil or resource-based policies, right? So the government as a, a means of redistributing wealth, which is why we have government, can get out of control very quickly. And there's a almost infinite number of examples of the government getting out of control. So that's what that all-pay auction was not necessarily about. I mean, it was about the whole idea of lobbying, but there's different types of lobbying. There's a lobbying of, of one special interest group that is going to lobby for themselves at the expense of the general population, which is the logic of collective action. And then there's the t other type of lobbying, which is special interest groups that are competing over things, right? The medical, um, the debate over medical, what is the health bill, what do they call it now? Health care reform. Health reform. The debate over health care reform has got different groups fighting with each other. You've got AARP saying that seniors need more money. You've got the child activists saying child, children need free insurance. You've got the, the Northern uh, Scandinavian Brigade saying we need a, a, a one-payer system. You've got the pharmaceutical companies saying we need more money. And in the middle of this scrum of lobbyists are all the politicians that are just like su sucking it up, basically. right? So um, that is, hopefully what emerges from that, in a sense, is something that serves us all. But on the other hand, it might serve a whole bunch of us, people, us special interest group, and not us. Right? That's the problem with um, politics, because, uh, because of that monopolistic power of, of government, is that whatever law does finally emerge, you don't, have opt you don't usually have an option to, to change uh, um, that you, to, to go somewhere else and not be under that law. This is, you know, if you, there was somebody I was reading the other day, um, that's the guy, the director Cameron, he did Titanic, and he's doing uh, Avatar, the new film. James Cameron. James Cameron. I read this profile of him, and um, he was applying for U.S. citizenship, and then when Bush won the 2004 election, he voided his application, right? So unless you can change countries, it's difficult to get away from political um, themes that you don't like. So that's just uh, a little bit more commentary on the importance of, of pol political policy making. Um, as I mentioned, I, it's all auction week for me, and, and I've got uh, some stuff closing up on eBay tonight. I'm very excited to see people buying uh, these watches. But I, the only reason I wanted to tell you this, that's, that's kind of funny, is that I started these auctions. Because who's done an auction on eBay? Who set a, rever a reserve price on their auction? Why did you set a re reserve price? I want at least that amount. Of money. At least that amount, right? So now let's talk about supply and demand, right? You're the supplier, right? And there's other suppliers that are competing with you, for example, unless it's like a Picasso, right? And um, so you're asking, you say, I want a reserve price that's this much, but what if the market demand is not there for your reserve price? You, um, well, then I would just, based on that option, I just resell it and have maybe a lower reserve. You would lower the reserve. But, so the question, actually, so what I would think about setting the reserve price is, in a sense, that's how much you value that item to yourself, right? If you don't give me 20 bucks, I'd rather keep it, that kind of item, right? So if you set a reserve price with that logic, that makes a lot of sense. But I was like, I gotta get rid of these watches. They're all dead in my drawer. So I set 99 cent reserve prices, or whatever, <laughs> starting prices. And now one of them's up to $36 and $34. But this is just, I think, um, a strategy that I use for eBay, and I, I you know, it's kind of, an interesting lesson, I think, in, in dynamics of markets is that 99 cents, a whole bunch of people are like, ooh, a watch for 99 cents, I'll bid on that, right? But if, if I said $35, which is where it's already at $36, then a whole bunch of people never would have looked at the auction, right? So it's important to kind of keep that in mind, and more, as far as I was concerned, it's like the market will determine what my watch is worth, including 99 cents. I'm going to sell at least one for 99 cents. So um, anyway, that's more auction stuff that's going on. All right, anything else on auctions? I can move along to the next topic, the repeat stuff. No? Okay, so um, the briefing grading is, uh, got some people a little agitated. And I'm uh, going to try and discuss the various issues here. But let me start at the start, which is that, um, number one, we all agree that you're doing a briefing. Okay. Number two, we all agree that they have to be graded. Everybody on the, on the same page as far as that's concerned? Okay. Now, they can all have tens, like your, you know, your blog post. 
So then the problem is that um, uh, if I have to see that you have this problem of, of the, the quality of the grader. Who is the grader, right? And grading written briefings means that essentially it have to be probably one person, and, and we might be able to divide it between the three uh, GSIs, uh, or the two GSIs and me. But the goal, my goal, is actually to have peer grading, to have you guys grade each other. So in a sense, that's out the door, okay? That because that's my goal, and the reason it's my goal is because I want you guys not only to be writing um, for each other, right, in a sense, but also I want you to, to be on the flip side of that page. I want you to, to think like graders. I want you to think like analysts and critical reasoning people, okay? So it's not just like, oh, I wrote that and now I'm done. What I want you to do is analyze three other students, your three other uh, colleagues' papers, and then be able to give them critical feedback. That's why you are handing in a written evaluation of each person's briefing. Is that is everybody clear on that right now? Yes? Okay. I think, I don't know if I set a limit on the evaluation, but let's just say that's one page also. Okay, I'm not interested in 15 pages of why that person can't spell. So, excuse me? Each one. Yeah, so in a sense, you'll hand in one page, and then you're going to have to write three more pages grading each other's papers. So, the grading might be more work, if you want, but uh, or more words, or more, more pieces of paper. But it's going. What you're going to do? What I would suggest you're going to do. Um, okay, hold on a second. So, the now the problem with with this system of peer grading is that you know, say that you're Mr. Nice Guy. Oh, like all these guys are great. That's a ten. That's a ten. That's a ten. Right? And then like you're really like mean or hard. And it's you know a two and a three and a four. Right? So I have to be able. We have to be able to control for that heterogeneity among graders. Now, there's different ways of doing that. I could say you've got 20 points total to distribute among the three papers. Do it any way you want. But I prefer, because then you might get a 10 or a, what do you call it, a 10 and a 5 and a 5, or a 10 and a, and a 9 and a 1, right? That could happen. But what I want to do is I want to impose more structure on the grading. And that's why I said first, second, third, or more importantly, um, 9, 7, and 5 points. Okay, which is the equivalent of first, second, and third. I don't want to give you guys the discretion of choosing how many points those papers get. I'm giving you the discretion of deciding which of the three are uh, better relative to the other two that you're seeing. Right? So, now some people are worried, well, wait a second. What if my amazing paper, which is what you're all going to write, goes to three people that have no clue about how great I am, and they give me five, five, and five. I get the lowest point on each time. That, I think, is the fear of some people. And um, it's hard to, that is actually a theoretical possibility, but it's uh, an actual not so likely situation. If you have a good paper, and it goes to three people, and those three people are comparing your paper to essentially six other papers, everybody understand the math here? Then, you know, if, if, if they decide that those six papers are all better than your great paper, then maybe the person who's got a problem is you as far as how great your paper is, okay? So in some sense, you have to be able to trust the other students and that the fact that they have good judgment. On the other hand, life isn't fair and people are judging you all the time despite the fact that you don't deserve it. So what I'm hoping is that when there's three versions of your paper instead of just one version of your paper out there, that on average, you'll get a grade that is more fair than not fair. Does that make sense? Does anybody have a better idea of how to run this metric through. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying or different, a comment or a different idea. Yeah. The only thing I'm worried about from the grading side of it, what if you get three papers that are pretty equally close and then one person ends up getting a 10 and the other gets a 5 or maybe there really was that much of a difference. Right. So how do you decide which one? And then I thought maybe if, um, if the grading scale wasn't like that and you could just decide on your own if they get a 10 or, a seven or an 8 or a 7 or whatever. Then you have to justify your writing to you and the GSIs. So right. Then you could use that to weigh. That will give somebody more. That's a good point. And here's what I would suggest. What I suggest is that if you have to split hairs, or flip coins even, to decide between first and second place, then, then do that. And then write that on your, your written uh, grading. What I'm going to do when I look at the written grading is I'm going to cross-correlate not only what you write, but what other people write about each paper. It's going to be a complete nightmare for us as the graders. I mean, you know, oh, 
90 papers, that's too much. Give me 270 papers, that's much more fun, right? So the GSIs and I, unfortunately, I'm going to enlist them in this uh, endeavor. But what we're going to do is we're going to cross-check what you say about a given paper against what other people are saying about that given paper. And let's say it this way, I have the ability to override my own rule if it seems like it makes sense. I'm not a rigid idiot as far as that stuff is concerned. Okay, it's not the DMV. So um, does that address your concern? I would mention that explicitly in your write-up on the paper. If you say, I'm giving this whatever, first place, you can, we'll have to just agree on a jargon. But if you say, I'm giving this first place, or second place, but it's really good, it's almost, it's like, I would really give it, da, da, da. you could go ahead and write that in. But make it like, you know, less than a sentence, and at the top, okay? And then you're essentially going for uh, arbitration by us, okay? And, and um, once we see the results, then we'll take, the, we'll take all that stuff into consideration as far as what to do, okay? Good. Another question? Yeah. I guess, I mean, this would definitely be more work for you, but... Um, like one thing I would think you could do is have the peer grading and then also have you and the GSIs read the papers and it could be based on... Oh, we will be seeing everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because like I was thinking, if your scores were factored in, if you gave like a 5, 7, or 10, right. 2, like it would... Oh, you mean that we actually score them as well? So yeah. it's a fourth score? So it's a fourth score. Fourth score seven years ago. Um, no, I'm going to defer to your judgment on grading, but... Um, we might have some wiggle room as far as stuff is concerned. When you hand in your, your grading on stuff, staple the original behind it. Okay? So um, I'm going to make notes because I'm going to do the protocol here. <coughs> um, now, the. Um, the other thing is that everybody should know that when you bring this in next Tuesday, you will bring three copies, okay? And you will put your four last four on the upper right corner. I, um, if I get mean, I might reject anything that doesn't meet that criteria, okay? Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Tuesday. The three, the last four of your SID, yeah. I feel that the grading of five cents is kind of too harsh. I think the effect of like eight, nine, and ten is still for It's five, seven, and nine, by the way. Oh, seven. Yeah. A little great inflation already. Seven. Sorry, uh, it's too harsh. Go uh, ahead. Um, so it should be like ten, nine, and eight. Yeah, close together. Because like I feel like actually maybe like nine and a half, nine point seven five. I have to set it somewhere. It's reasonably arbitrary. I could I could make it worse. It could be nine, six, and three. Right. So in a sense, you're getting five for turning in crap. Okay? If you do better than average, then you're going to get a higher grade. Yeah. Did you say 975? 975. Isn't that out of 10? Yeah. So no one That's my wiggle room. So in case, if someone comes in with three nines, we'll probably bump it up to a 10. Or if they, I don't even know. We're going to have to grade the grading too. Can you, is it all text or can you throw a graph? If it fits in a page, you can throw a graph. You can put a one page graph if you feel like. A picture is a thousand words, right? And 250 words on a page, so you can go ahead and do that. So you get as many graphs as you want. If the graders can't read it and they give you zero or five points, then that's cool. But you know, it's and I and I. Uh, by the way, no. The funny thing is that there's all this kind of uproar about, oh my God, the grading. But like, this is the world's hardest assignment. Did anybody notice that? Okay. So like, no complaints about that. Cool, right? It's like, hey, let's go to the moon. But wait a second, what are we gonna eat? You know, come on, you guys. It's this is this is small potatoes. Um, so actually about the assignment, um, does it have to be within a state or can it be within, limited to a city or to the whole any, country? Or? You can use any example okay. of any uh, uh, policy situation, any polity situation, city, state, or federal, <coughs> you want to. It has to obviously be clear to your readers. So it has to be a policy that is currently in place? It could be, could it could be a general principle on how to fix this globally. Okay. Okay. It, because And the reason I gave you the world's hardest assignment is because of what has been observed many times in the past is that young folks who don't know better come up with the best ideas, okay? I personally am desperate for a good idea. So among the 90 of you, I'm hoping that like the Nobel Prize emerges out of this essay and it's not going to be me collecting it, okay? So just keep that in mind. So my impression was you kind of, after a push, is like a campaign manager, or like, is that correct? I mean, Think of your, I mean, it, the question is, how do you... As, so there's some, 
an elected politician who is, you're giving advice to, who is going to face re-election in less than two years. That's kind of the implicit situation, but that's, keep that in mind in terms of framing your, your, your uh, presentation. <coughs> Good? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so when I read the assignment, I read it a bunch of times, it seemed like you were like looking for something, like you had this like secret solution that you're looking you don't have a secret solution. No. This is really a hard question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Be a nice person is not an answer for yeah. that. You can make up a totally fictional Yes, you can. You have one page to do it. So I mean don't go off into fantasy land and you have like three words left at the end to get your solution. You know, don't define a new currency and a new measuring system. Yeah. Uh, does, does this briefing require us to read um, the micro motives? And micro motives and macro behavior? No. Okay. Just the In line. fact, I, I mean, I suggested, you know, quick like, you know, read the collect logic of collective action. You have to read it anyway, and it really matters for this assignment. You don't have to, you don't, don't sit there and say work cited, you know, Manker Olson. This is a briefing. Politicians don't read books, right? They read briefings. So don't worry about work cited. Just, if you have to, I mean, and if you actually, besides outright plagiar plagiarism, if you take ideas, just go ahead and write through fluidly, right? But don't drop jargon in, because then it's going to be like, and you also as graders will say, oh, jargon, I don't get it. Like, I'm a fourth grade education, I'm a politician, right? So don't, uh, don't play with that. Yeah. Um, when we turn it in, are you going to be redistributing it that day and then we turn it in like Yeah, we're going to try and roll it out the same class period. I'm going to talk to my GSIs about how to do that. Um, it could end up being like kind of one of these musical chair circuses where we throw them off in the air and people grab whatever's in front of them, but I have no idea. I'm still thinking about it um, until, in terms of trying to randomize the redistribution. Oh, and then there's this other thing. Hold on, let me see here. Um, where someone sent me this email and said, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to exchange all my numbers with my friends, and then we're all going to give each other top grades. And I was like, you know, there's a simpler way to cheat than that. Wait until you see what you got, and then tell your friends, you know, ooh, Facebook, you know, ooh, you have this stuff. And the thing is, the cheating is dumb. And it's dumb because it doesn't serve you as the grader, because then when you grade and you say, I gave this a top grade, and we look at, you know, say that your friend sucks, for example, and that, they got a 5-5 five, five and you give them the 9, you're going to get nailed on your grading for not using critical reasoning. That, I, will, I will be very happy to do that. And actually, I have like a zero tolerance on cheating. So given that you guys actually care about doing a good job and that cheating is a waste of time because of karma and learning, and that's why we're all here, then um, what I suggest you do is you take full advantage of this opportunity as a grader to really exercise some critical reasoning. You will learn more grading these other papers than you probably will learn from writing them, okay? And as far as I'm concerned, I've been teaching this class from the get-go as a learning situation, not as, you know, swallow it and spit it up on the test. Because if you walk out of this class and you don't learn anything, then I've, I've failed, okay? And I want you guys to learn. And, and by the way, this, is, this was inflicted on me in high school. We had a class, and, and you guys are getting off easy. We would present our essay and then someone would stand up and critique it in front of class and the rest of the class would critique it for the rest of the hour. Tears were shed. It was brutal, right? But it really taught me a lot about, you know, getting to the point because if you know that someone's going to rip your stuff apart, you had better cover your ass in a million different ways in terms of being good in the writing. And it's not going to be some lazy uh, uh, professor or tired GSI that's going to be grading your stuff by, you know, I throw it off the stairs and the top step gets an A and the bottom step gets an F, okay? It's going to be people that are reading your stuff and they're looking for holes in your logic and your reasoning, okay? And this is what you're learning in economics, is you're learning analytical techniques. So, yeah. Is the peer grading uh, grading on your part pretty much binary? Like you do a good job? Zero five? No, it's going to be zero to five. There will be steps. Are we going to get the gradings of our briefings back? Yeah, that's my goal. So in a sense, um, at the we'll distribute the, the grading of the briefing back, whatever, a week later, and the grading of the, of the second briefing back at the final. Yay. Okay. Right. <laughs> so any other? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the grading, but... You can appeal everything, right? Within one week in writing. Written, written, and it'll be like 15 pages long by the time this gets done, right? <laughs> um,
Okay. Any other questions on this? I think I've said a lot of stuff. Who is still... Well, I don't even know. I don't even know how to ask it. If you're still dissatisfied, I'm sorry. Okay? We're doing this as an experiment. Hopefully you'll learn something from it. Um, and... Um, Oh, and by the way, this is called double blind, right? The, neither the reviewer nor the writer knows who each other are, right? This is double blind is the technology. The next one we do is going to be double blind, but it's really going to be single blind because it'll be you handing in your briefings. And I'm going to, uh, sorry, your, your rewritten blog posts as, as briefing too. And technically, um, I actually, I think it'll be fine for the people that are reviewing your, your briefing twos to go and look up at your original blog post and then check that against what you handed in potentially and the comments that people made. Because the first thing they should do is look and see what the critical comments were and if you address them in briefing two. Okay? So that'll be single blind. You will be grading somebody's briefing number two and they won't know who you are. Okay? Um, and that's uh, the reason that, that blind uh, reviewing and blind grading is popular is because then you don't have to worry about how popular you are. Uh, as far as feedback on people. Any other questions about this stuff? Yeah. So, is it, so then the last four digits for ID, like in lieu of name? That's right. Yeah. Last four digits in lieu of your name. Okay. I checked before the class began this semester, there's no overlap of four digit codes. Anything else? Okay. As usual, if, you have, if somebody has some further comment or worry or concern, send me an email on the side. It could be anonymous and I will uh, deal with it in whatever way I think best. Right. So there was um, a thing that I left out from the last, or the first half of the class. I, did I, um, what is this? Did I, did I give you this example, market A and market B? Did I show you this? And there was two different demand curves and all that stuff? Okay, so actually, I'm just senile. So we don't have to talk about that next. Um, Baptists and bootleggers. This is relevant for the briefing. And it's, um, I, I'm not sure, there's a, there's a couple, there's a, a tag on my blog, and I think there's a blog post, but I'm going to tell you about it now so you know what it means. Um, this was coined by a guy named Bruce Yandel, um, who's a, very charming, good old boy who worked inside of the Reagan administration of regulation. He's the one, I, I was talking to him a couple of years ago, and I said, Bruce, what is up with all of the uh, subsidies? Why don't people fight subsidies in Washington? And he said, well, you know, the thing about subsidies is that everybody hates subsidies, except for the ones that go to them, right? And in a sense, that's where this, this uh, word uh, log rolling has come, come about. Have you heard of this word? Log rolling is essentially the trading of favors. And I actually, I'm trying to think of the image. I, I think of like a, a, a lumberjack that's like uh, running along in a log and spinning the log that's in the water. Have you ever seen one of those things? And that sounds like log rolling to me, but it's, it's kind of like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And what happens is you have when any kind of um, political compromise You've got Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C, and Mr. D, and you know D wants this, and B wants that, and C wants this, and A wants that, and they're all like, I will vote for your thing if you vote for my thing, right? That's trading of favors. It's um, log rolling. That's the expression in politics. So that's how a lot of negotiations get done and compromises are made, and sometimes the bad news is that all of those people get what they want at the expense of Mr. E. Right? So that's sometimes why it's critical to have a seat at the table or to have veto power, for example. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in the waterfront has basically said, I'm pretty sure he's backed off, but he said, I will not do anything in terms of reforming California water law unless there are dams included. Almost every economist knows that any new dams in California are a complete waste of money, but Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, according to somebody I was talking to, has got religion meaning completely irrational desire for dams. And he will not, uh, sorry about that, religious people. But um, religion actually is not about rationality as far as I'm concerned. It's a belief, right? So there's a difference between belief and rationality. And so he believes that dams are necessary regardless of all of the evidence, right? And so for him, 
a person who has veto power, he's basically saying, you know, a couple weeks ago he was saying, I'm going to veto 700 bills unless you give me dams in the water bill. And then he backed away because I think he realized how stupid he looked. And, um, and now the, the new water bill that's under negotiation that I'm following from a very great distance, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it has no dams in it. Um, and that is, in a sense, showing that uh, how outside that perspective was. He can't bring that to the table as a negotiating position because it's just non-tenuous. There's not enough support among these other groups to, to keep that damn uh, item on the agenda. So that's what Law Overland refers to. Baptists and bootleggers is a much more uh, insidious concept that is uh, significant in terms of uh, the uh, the propaganda of politics. And the analogy is a very simple one. Imagine that you're in a southern town where the Baptists are the prevalent congregation. The Baptists tend to be fairly um, conservative in their beliefs, and one of their beliefs is that you should not be drinking alcohol. Right Now this is not exactly a dry town, and what they do is they go to the city council and they say, um, it's God's will that we not uh, sell alcohol on Sunday because it's the Lord's Day. It's reserved for the Lord's business. We shouldn't be selling it. Now, we can't keep people from imbibing it because they buy it on a different day, but let's not sell it. And the city council, in order to keep their, situ their, their, their uh, political approval ratings among the majority population of the town, says that's a good idea. We will ban the sale of alcohol on Sunday. And so the Baptists, who are the holier-than-thou types, uh, how do I, I don't even know how to draw a devil and an angel, but let's just do this. These are the angels. The angels do something that's good for us. But then what, happen, what happens to the supply and the demand of alcohol on a Sunday? There's our demand, and there's our supply. <coughs> what happens to the supply of alcohol on a Sunday? Would there be no supply? I tell you, if, if, if you want to buy this for $2,000, I'll sell it to you right now. Black market. Black market. <laughs> People who bought it. So there's going to be a resale market, right? But let's just say it this way. There is going to be a shift in in supply curve, right? That's pretty obvious because you've just eliminated the retail competition. And the people that are still selling alcohol on Sunday are the bootleggers, right? Bootleggers, a term for prohibition, <laughs> are the people that don't follow the retail licensing laws, they will sell you alcohol out of their boot, or out of their, literally their boot, or out of their trunk, which is a boot in English terminology, right? So you can still get alcohol. And guess what has happened to the price? Right? It goes up, and all the boozers have got to pay more. Can you just go to another city? We're just going to make it a Baptist region. <laughs> Transactions costs are huge, right? But that's a great example. I know, I know that you have dry counties in various states, and you just go to the next county over. The whole alcohol laws are insane. They're really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, about that, I think in Alaska there are a lot of dry village communities, and I watched a documentary, and basically a bottle of whiskey that you can buy at the store for $10 sells in one of those communities for $250, right. and all it does is it creates a huge incentive for people to try right. and get the alcohol. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know, banning alcohol sales, guess what? Black market, prohibition. Banning drug sales, black market, drug dealers. You know, it's like it just happens over and over again. Go to Scandinavia where a, a beer costs 10 bucks. People are like getting off the plane, going to the duty free, <coughs> buying cases of beer and, and, and bottles of vodka and taking it home. It's just like, it just, what it does is it just channels that demand somewhere else. Okay? Now, I think there is a shift in in terms of quantity consumed, but what's going on with consumer surplus if we actually care? Consumer surplus is lower, right? And more importantly, there's a transfer of rents to those boot bootleggers, right? So what happens is when the city council says, oh my God, we have to do the Lord's work and, and save our citizens, the bootleggers like, oh boy, can't wait for that one. Now this example, Baptists and bootleggers, happens a lot, and it doesn't happen just for alcohol. One of the, another example that Bruce gave, um, that was very good, is, is uh, lawnmower manufacturing and safety regulations, right? Your lawnmower has to have an automatic stop, it has to have a blade, if you get your finger near it, it stops, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can say. In the name of safety, 
right? To the point where the safety features are like rocket science. You know, your, your lawnmower is more advanced than, your, than the, the car parked in your driveway. And who benefits from that kind of regulation? Whoever makes the safety components, yes. And which manufacturers benefit? And which manufacturers lose? The low cost manufacturer would lose because they probably don't have the ability, the technology to right. put all that in. And the guys that are selling, I mean, imagine one of those manual mowers that don't have any guards at all, right? You just walk along and, oh my god, a baby could fall in there and die, right? So we're going to have to cover up the mower and put a, a warning sign and automatic bumpers and stuff like that. And like the dude who was making the same, the company rather, that's been making the same mower for 150 years is out of business, right? So the low-cost competitors lose, and what happens to consumers? How do they do? Are they better off or are they worse off? Are they safer? Maybe. I mean, sometimes they're safer from nothing, right? You can have a regulation that will keep you safe from nothing, but it's a regulation, okay? It's the whole putting baby seats in the airplane type of thing. Now that I think about it, I think the baby seat in the airplane is just a stupid example of something that never happened. It sounds too dumb to be true. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. So for our briefing, we have to avoid that situation. This is where you would please both groups. Well, um, what, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, maximize, uh, increase the benefits to society, right? And you're trying to go against this kind of special interest combination. This is a typical combination that special interests come up with, right? So, um, if you can use that same Baptist and bootleggers logic to get what you want in terms of benefiting the public, then go for it, right? But usually this applies to special interest groups. Does that answer your question? No? I'm just confused what you meant by, like, but, like, benefit the average citizen but not the special interest group. Right. So you wouldn't benefit the bootleggers this... or the Baptists, but rather... Yeah, this, so the, the benefits of the Baptists are zero, because they don't drink booze, right? And the benefits of the bootleggers are large and positive, but the, there's a, a, the social welfare, in terms of the whole dead weight loss triangle, the, the one that we're always used to talking about, is smaller, right? So there's a transfer of rents from consumers to producers, first of all. There's a dead weight loss, secondly, right? So I want you, in your briefing, to talk, to think from the perspective of consumers. Okay. Wouldn't there be a non-monetary uh, benefit to the Baptists of alcohol consumption? Meaning they feel better about other people not drinking? Um, I think yes, but that falls in a category that I'm not going to condone. Right? If I feel good because that person's dead, it's not exactly the kind of logic I want to pursue. Because that's what it is. I feel good when you feel bad, right? So, um, if somebody wants to drink, that's fine. If it's drunk driving, killing innocent children, that's a different story, right? But I actually read this uh, thing um, about one of the founders of, of MAD, and M-A-D-D, -D, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And she was pissed off because she said, look, I founded this organization because my daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And the people that, that and she actually denounces her own organization because they took it over and they wanted to become prohibitionists. She's like, I like drinking. I just don't like drinking and driving, right? So if you're focusing on drinking and driving, don't go over to drinking, right? That's the, that's the point. Okay, think about the outcome. Fight the outcome. Don't fight the, the process that might be true. I guess that's kind of like treat the symptoms, not the disease, or the other way around. I don't know if it's bad now. Yeah. Um, so with this alcohol example, I am just curious to know what about other drugs like heroin and cocaine? So would you, because it's the same problem, I mean, we're just, it's just saying that they're not okay at all, not... The so Baptist and bootlegger, I mean, the, the, I think that the funniest thing is that the, the drug dealers, uh, especially the cartels that are having this kind of civil war in Mexico right now, they don't want those drugs to be legal. They're making crazy profits. I, I remember that the, 
I mean, uh, I did some research on opium and heroin, and heroin in uh, at the Af at the Afghan Pakistani border, where a lot of uh, opium and heroin comes from, it sells for about I think it's about a thousand dollars a kilo of heroin, 100% pure. It sells for eight hundred fifty thousand dollars a kilo in the United States. That's a price markup. Right? Drug dealers make so much money that they will fly a plane over the border, take the drugs out of the plane, and then leave the plane behind, because that's worth less. Right? So think the economics of drugs are insane because of the, the profitability of drugs. That's why they also kill each other all the time. So would you suggest um, to legalize all drugs? I mean, would that be one? I would think that some people do I do, yeah. a solution. Yeah. So even heroin and... Legalize and regulate. Like cigarettes and alcohol and other pharma drugs. In fact, most of the pharma drugs suck compared to the illegal, illegal drugs. When I got my surgery, they gave me this opiate, and I was like, I've had better than that, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, there's actually, the funny thing is, in, the, in Holland, they have medical marijuana, right? But no one buys it, because you can get better uh, uh, marijuana in the coffee shops. So that, that would have been my next point, with Holland, where it is legal, yeah. um, they actually, at least I've heard, they've done studies where a lot of the other drug use is much higher too, and they have a lot more problems with heroin and cocaine. I, um, that's the gateway drug hypothesis, and and so the the, the, fun, the fin, so the gateway drug hypothesis, which is a little bit of a, a diversion, but it's one of my favorite topics, so I will <laughs> indulge you. And so uh, the gateway drug is that oh, people that use heroin have used marijuana, so marijuana leads to heroin leads to heroin. And other people who are clever with their analysis have said, have said that uh, breast milk is also a gateway drug. Because people that use her uh, heroin also drank breast milk. So clearly, breast milk is a gateway drug. So, um, that was a joke if you guys didn't get it. So, uh, the gateway, the thing is that the statistics on marijuana use in Holland is that they, uh, there's lower uh, population participation in marijuana in Holland than there is in this country. It's something like 17%. My, my girlfriend is Dutch. And like she's like, you're stupid. You smoke dope. I'm like, whatever. I'm American. And so they all go. They go through it like like the French go through drinking wine. You're drinking wine when you're 13. By the time you're 18 or 21, it's boring, right? Getting drunk. What's up with these drunk people? Because all the English show up and they get drunk, right? Or they do drugs. And, and the Dutch and the French are like weird because they never acclimatize to using the drug, right? So that's a complicated thing. The gateway drug. Uh, there's a counterexample of the gateway drug hypothesis, which is that. Um, if you make marijuana illegal and you have to go to a dealer to buy it, and the dealer's like, hey, I've got marijuana, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, all these other things, and they're like, oh good, I'm already at the mall, why don't I get everything, right? So making it illegal leads to more drug use. It's complicated. But the one thing is, is that the, the statistics on marijuana are, are, are incontrovertible, right? They, they are that there's lower marijuana use when it's legalized in that country. And there, obviously, it's almost de facto legal in California. And you can get anybody can get a medical card in like twenty minutes and a hundred bucks. Yeah. Anybody else questions? Yeah. So with the there was one that was like uh, prostitution and pimps, or like one of the examples. So that would be right. Know, like people who want to limit the number of prostitutes, the pimps would want that to happen because then they would have make prostitution people. illegal and only pimps can stay in business. Right. Absolutely right. right. Because um, the the. Pimps are a very interesting category too. Another one of my favorite topics. Um, they tend to. I have a a friend who I would never recommend, uh, never introduce to a girl, a, a girl who I knew, because he's one of these kinds. Of, you have these kinds of dodgy guy friends you just don't want your girlfriends to meet. And uh, and he's like, well, thank God for for uh, abusive fathers, because otherwise we wouldn't have prostitutes and strippers, right? So there's there's this really sad thing going down with that. And the, the psychology of prostitution and pimps is actually um, um, very sad. It's very perverse. Uh, but the, uh, I, was talking, I, was, I was talking to a student group the other day about going to Amsterdam, and, and you know, prostitution is legal there. And I went to the Prostitution Information Center, and it's like, so, you know, there's this prostitute sitting there, like, what do you want to know about? It's like, it's like an info booth, you know? It's like, it's like, oh, you want to get on the metro or whatever. And I said, so what are you guys really worried about? And they're like, oh, we're worried about our pensions, right? Because they were just like workers, and it was so bloody boring. And a lot of, a lot of the prostitutes will say they, they don't want to deal with pimps because pimps get a piece of the action. In fact, they get, this is actually shocking. Pro, uh, prostitutes don't make any money at all. They hand it all over to their pimps. And the pimps will give them, they'll take care of them, right? 
And that's part of the mind fuck that goes on between prostitutes and pimps. So if, if they can actually go off and, and be independent contractors or band together in a cooperative and stuff like that, because it is legal, then it's better for them, the, the prostitutes, right? And you know, I'm not even talking about female trafficking and stuff like that, which I, or, or actually male trafficking, but female trafficking is a disaster. Las Vegas has a lot of trafficked women. I was surprised, not too surprised to hear that. Because uh, prostitution is illegal in Las Vegas, you didn't know that. It's legal in the, in the counties in Nevada that have a population of less than whatever. And Clark County has a population of more than whatever. So, you know, it's, it's legal to go, it's like as George Carlin said, it's legal, to, it's legal to fuck, it's legal to buy things. Why is it legal to whatever, right? So why is it legal? But, um, so that's, one, that's another kind of Baptist and bootlegger thing. It's like, oh, Las Vegas, we don't have prostitution here. Let's ban it, you know? We'll save ourselves from it. And all the pimps are like, yeah, because all the convention guys, they don't want to go out in the desert, right? But they, they come in and, they, and then the girls are, a lot of the girls are trafficked. Um, I, was, I was told it's one of the worst trafficking locations in the world. Uh, and that's sad. So the social welfare in this example would be the quality of life for the prostitutes? Absolutely. The Baptist, oh, if you did a Baptist and bootleggers on prostitution, the people that are hurt by illegal prostitution are the prostitutes. They lose money to pimps. They're, they, the pimps inflict violence on them. Their johns can inflict violence on them. Um, they get a lower price because they can't offer uh, to a competitive market. They have to kind of like, you know, how much for this and how much for that. The Johns clearly lose welfare because they have ac access to lower, um, they have a, a harder search mechanism. And the pimps make a lot of money. And the cops, they make lots of bad things, right? Cops, for cops getting free sex off of prostitutes is a, is a huge problem. Free, I would call it, it's just like rape. Yeah. Um, I think in this example, we're kind of assuming that prostitutes want to be prostitutes. Totally assuming that, yes. So what about the fact that a lot of prostitutes are not actually willing, or they're not, they don't actually want this career? That is the trafficking, basically. The girls that are trafficked or enslaved, any, any other word you want to use. Those uh, prostitutes are worse off in an illegal environment because everybody's illegal. And even worse, if they're trafficked and it's illegal, and you come from another country and they've got your passport, you're already breaking the law once because you're an illegal migrant, and you're breaking the law twice because you're a prostitute. So you're afraid to go to the police because you're actually doing something that's illegal. Right? This is a problem also with migrant workers. Who, who benefits from illegal migrant workers? Do the workers benefit from that? Kind of, because they cross the border, most of them. But the people that really benefit from that are the coyotes and the people that run the labor gangs. Right? And I've heard from... Um, uh, Professor uh, Martin up at Davis, he basically says that the worst uh, uh, labor crew leaders are also Mexican nationals because they know how to push these workers within an inch of their life, which is bad for the workers. Who else benefits? The farmers who want to pay below market wages, right? We are harmed as a, a tax paying population because of medical claims and school claims by people that are not paying into the tax system and are only going to emergency when they are losing blood, right? Because they can't go for preventative medicine. So the Baptist bootleggers thing occurs over and over and over again. And people are like, oh, this is a problem. It's like, we have to save such and such a population or stop such and such a bad behavior by making it illegal. Well, that, you've got to remember that making it illegal doesn't mean that people will stop doing it, right? And I'm not saying that murder should be made legal, because it's clearly a problem, right? But the, the alignment of costs and benefits between murderer and murder victim are much clearer, right? But the, the Baptist and bootleggers it involves these, these triangles of, of different groups. Does, does that answer your question? I, I think that, I mean, involuntary prostitution is a disaster. I mean, I would, I, actually, I'm, I'm a big fan of shooting the people that do that. I don't really mean, like, trafficking or being forced into prostitution, but I mean, like, economic incentives. Ah, economic incentives. Well, in that sense, you would be in favor of legal prostitution because then the girls would make more money and they'd get out of it sooner. Right? There's, there's many of them. I, I was talking, it's like, yeah, besides the pension, yeah, I bought my house, I, and da 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 I mean, the, I actually saw a paper that just came out, and if somebody's curious about it, send me an email. It's like 70, 60 pages with serious amounts of data. And prostitutes that are being surveyed through one of these prostitute rating web, rating websites, like, uh, it's like, I don't even know what's, what, what's it, it's like, um, it's like Yelp for prostitutes, right? And uh, they're making $250 an hour as escorts, right? And so, um, 
taking that into consideration, I hope it's a risk-reward ratio that they're interested in. But there's an entire economics of prostitution, which is quite interesting in many ways. Yeah? We don't have bootlegger situations involve property rights issues, so we couldn't use them in our papers. Because you could use them in your paper. It doesn't necessarily involve uh, property rights. I mean, I mean, making prostitution legal is property. Is that not? Is that no, it's not. Those, that's making. That's going from. Remember the the diagram that I said at the start of the semester. Markets, right? Missing markets. Um, We're talking about a missing market because okay. the market's then turned black. So you can make a missing market. We can. Identify missing market. Um, well, what's going on with the Baptists and bootleggers? What they're doing is they're taking a market and making it missing, right? In order to turn it into a black market in a way. I mean, missing markets are more like environmental goods and stuff like that. But going from a market to a black market is kind of just like adding massive transactions costs and making it inefficient. So we're talking really about. Um, Changing the dynamics of an existing market. Not necessarily. I think that's wrong. Don't. It's not missing. It's 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 changing the dynamics of an existing market and increasing the transactions costs, right? And 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 changing market power. That's what's really going on as far as drugs and prostitution and stuff like that. As far as you know, but what you guys might be concerned about in your briefing are things like missing markets, maybe because maybe all of us should be benefiting from. Uh, environmental regulation or legislation that would uh, stop the earth from warming up, but there's a lobby from the energy companies that likes to sell energy, right? I mean, their, their business is selling carbon, right? Shut down my business, I, I lose money, right? So they have an incentive to block legislation that reduces the use of carbon. Okay. Let's, uh, uh, Faye, let's stop the thingy and roll it back and forth. That's a good question. So the, the just to repeat the tape for our students abroad. Um, are we changing the demand of consumers, right? So when I wrote, when I wrote this up, I, I just had the demand function sitting here. There is clearly a shift in for demand when you, have, when you make something illegal because some consumers do not have the taste of consuming illegal goods, right? Um, and, and then on the other hand, some of them do. <coughs> Right? Teenagers and smoking. Oh, it's illegal. Can't wait to do it. Right? So, um, it's, it's dubious how that's shifting demand. I'm just taking that as given, and I'm saying we're talking about supply shifts. Right? Because when you eliminate all of the liquor retailers, you're shifting, affecting the supply. Right? Just hold, just, and just looking at that and holding demand constant, you can make an analysis. Okay? Yeah? So, for our um, briefing, are we supposed to be appealing to the Baptist? I said you can, the Baptist would tend, the Baptist and bootlegger dynamic would tend to be going against what you're uh, writing in favor of. But like, doesn't everyone want to be like the good guy? And like, yeah. I want to fight this bad thing that's happening, so I, if a politician does something against that, then, or they should be appealing to me. You can use this mechanism, you can use this um, technique if you want to advance your cause, but remember that your cause is, is your cause is this. You're trying to max this. Okay? So if you shift it in, you're going the wrong direction. Okay? But the people that are, you're fighting against will be trying to shift it in. They will be trying to cut supply so they can benefit from it. I mean, as, as the example of Baptist and bootleggers, right? Other people might, the, the businesses that are, um, actually it's the same kind of shift. If you have carbon legislation, then you might be shifting in the, the uh, you might, sorry, um, yeah, you might be, you're increasing costs, essentially through a tax or whatever. So those people might be upset about selling less carbon, right? So it's the same shift in that the, the special interests will be fighting against, okay? But then there's also the distribution inside of this pie that is very, very common in politics. And that, that's also, you can address these issues at, at any combination of issues, but your, your whole goal really is, how do I do something that's going to have a net benefit on social welfare? Okay. Despite the interest of a special interest group. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it's necessarily a Baptist and bootleggers example, but like, um, it made sense in my head. But um, if you have a situation where um, it's like an environmental legislation, um, where you like, if you like, for example, you have like a 
like a section of a forest, like pres um, preserved, right. but due to like environmental concerns. So that's like, the other thing is like what environmentalists want, but it limits like. But supposing there was like an indigenous population living there who like needed that forest to like, live off of, right. but they don't have access to it anymore. Right. But that's like, but in a way, it's like bootlegging because if you've got like something like the government or the police involved, then it's like I think it just creates like a system of like corruption and like bribery. It's like to let people use the forest or not use the forest. So I don't know if it's like directly a Baptist bootlegger. That's that's a good right. example, and I think it does fit in the Baptist bootlegger's framework. What happens is this is a very common problem. You're going to have a beautiful nature area, and there's going to be an indigenous, po indigenous population living in there, and then they make a national park out of it, right? And they follow the U.S. national park model, which is that no people are allowed inside, and it has to be pristine without people, right? So people all move outside, and if they're, the worst case scenario, they're hunter-gatherers, then they have no source of income anymore, right? They've essentially, they have no property rights, because it's been taken away by the, by the government. And then, um, Many things can happen. One is that um, they just are poorer and suffer. Another one is that they go in and they're now illegally, um, now they're illegally doing what they used to do, right? But because it's not their property anymore, they don't care about being sustainable, or something like that. So they will poach animals or they will over harvest trees or whatever. But the typical situation that's even worse is that the army or whoever's guarding it will also really get into poaching. Right? and really get into cutting down trees. This, I know this is a huge problem in Nepal. Part of the civil war in Nepal was being fought over access to the forest and stuff like that. So it um, also happens in Africa a lot, and the, uh, with all of their national parks, we've got to keep it for the Mzungus. Mzungus? The Swahili word for white people is Mzungus, I think. Isn't it? I can't remember if that's the right name. Anyway, like, all, the, all the white tourists are going to come in and pay like 50 bucks to go to a such and such a safari, and all the locals are kicked out, and they're going to be like, you know, much poorer. And all, I don't remember the word, but they, but the the local people are not benefiting. All the permit fees go to the central government. The central government's totally corrupt, and you know, it's this horrible cycle, right? So that happens a lot in, in natural resources, especially. It'll happen with fisheries. The government off of, of the West African countries will sell the right to fish to the EU, which has already overfished all of their seas. And they'll come and exploit the West African fisheries. All the fishermen out of work, right? Or they've got to go out instead of going out three kilometers to get fish, they have to go out fifty, right? So all they're spending all this fuel going back and forth, and they can't even eat. And all their fish are going on a fish processing ship to go on fish and chips. So this, and the government is taking the money for their permits and not giving it to the people, which is the national wealth, because they're buying corporate jets and Swiss bank accounts. It's just horrible, driving me crazy. Yeah. So let's say this was our issue for the briefing. The yep. politician would ideally try helping the indigenous. Right, right. That's what our goal would be. In a sense, yes. What you would want to do is you would want to do, if it's a status quo situation, then you might want to maintain it against a special interest group that wants to log the forest, for example, right? Or, um, you know, you might want to say, well, how can we monetize this forest? This is a very big topic in carbon, in, in the climate change, right? How do we monetize the forest? And you might say, well, why don't we give all of these guys property rights so that they can collect the money from the forest not getting cut down? But then you're going to be fighting against a constituency that's going to want to um, eliminate those owners and turn it into a managed reserve that's going to, whatever, get clear cut and there'll be fraudulent certificates that are sold and all kinds of crap. I mean, in a sense, there's unlimited material in the, in, in the news right now about how almost every kind of, a lot of these failures are coming back to this essentially kind of special interest dynamic. But um, why aren't the Native American special interest group? Why aren't they a special interest group? Well, they, they were, and they got they got destroyed in many well, different ways. Well, but like, let's just say we take the situation where they're living in the National Park, and like, you're, they're like, there's a company trying to log it, or, you know, this area, and so you try and block off, you know, the area, or keep it for them without turning into the National Park. So you're benefiting the Native Americans at the expense of the logging company, at the expense of the consumer, who would have cheaper goods as a result of the increased supply from the logging. Who owns the for Who owns the national park? Uh, it's government property because. It's Why are the natives living on government property? Well, I mean, everything is government property. I'm living on government property. Ah, okay. We go back to ground zero. Okay, start. So, we're, the government controls everything, and there's some special interest group called Native Americans who want to live there. What you're saying? Right. So we have to fight against this special interest group. Well, no. What I'm saying is, how do we act in this situation without benefiting someone? Who is special special interest group? Uh, Everyone is special interest group. How do you yeah, broadly defined? 
Um, well, I, no, my question is more like, so, oh, could so, you give me a definition for special interest groups so that I could, you know, like, have a more better idea of here's, what here's, here's a good, here's a good, that's a good question. So let's look at the dynamics of this for a second. But let's look at what's going on. Um, we won't use this. Let's say that um, this is the sum, so, sum total of so, social welfare just now under status quo conditions. Okay? okay. Now let's say that you can go one of two ways. Um, You could either go over here as a, as a policy that destroys overall welfare but distributes a lot of it to special interest groups. In a sense like, oh, let's clear cut the forest. The, for the clear cut forest is worth a lot less than the alternative policy which is to monetize that forest. Right? And the special interest piece of that pie, let's make it small. Special interests are getting a smaller piece of a much bigger pie. And this is us. So it's okay to benefit a special interest group as long as society is benefited more than the special interest group is? Um, in a sense, it's okay to benefit a special interest group as long as overall benefits are greater. Okay. okay. So what you want is you want to get to this kind of... That's messy. Let me draw that a little bit better. You know, we're not going to shoot all the special interest groups because that's kind of like shooting ourselves, right? Everybody's a special interest in some way. You guys, are, people that are out lobbying for lower school fees, special interest group, right? So what we want is we want the pie to get bigger, period, right? And, the, and, and we want the share of wealth that goes to us, we the people, we want that share of wealth to be greater. So maximize social welfare, and maximize the distribution to the general public. Special interest groups will always be around. They might be, but the thing is, the special interest will clearly fight against this, because why? Why would special interests fight against this? They're not getting... That's right, they're getting more goodies out of this one, right? They don't give a shit about everybody else. Right, that's the whole, I mean, the U.S. sugar policy is exactly like that. We pay double or triple the, the world price for sugar, and it helps those little special interests and it harms all of us to the tune of only a dollar a year, right? But a dollar per American is $300 million going to a thousand different people that live in Florida and Louisiana. And destroy the bayou, by the way. Yeah. It's going back to the reading, Olson's reading. So yeah. she's talking, or Olson is talking about the first smaller pie, and maybe Ostrom is talking about the bigger pie. Uh, Lynn Ostrom is, um, yes, yes, Lynn Ostrom is talking about how do we get to these kinds of situations through um, dealing with those collective action dynamics. If you want, um, Manker Olson is kind of like the pessimist, right? It's like, oh my god, everything's going to fall into a disaster. And he's been proven right a million times, right? But Lynn Ostrom is also kind of the optimist. It's like, well, look, we don't have to go that way, right? Because Lynn Ostrom, before, if you ignore Lynn Ostrom, you think basically the only thing you can do is privatize everything. But she's like into community management. But I, I mentioned the briefing explicitly, you cannot wait for the community to evolve, right? Because some of, some of Lynn Ostrom's prescriptions, she's not prescriptions, the stuff that she studies takes years to evolve, right? You're talking about an election cycle. So just, you know, you can't wake up and care about everybody, and you can't evolve a whole bunch of social norms or new religion or whatever, right? Uh, yeah. So in this example, back to this example, wouldn't it be a larger wealth, I mean, benefit for, like, the public to kick out the indigenous and use the forest for, like, production? And it might. Because it would benefit the consumer in the sense that they pay less of the price for it. Unless all the wood is pulped and sent to Japan. The world, yeah, it could. I mean, the, the value of a standing forest these days tends to be higher than a cut forest. 
right? Think of, I mean, you haven't, we haven't done a lot of dynamics of natural resources, but the future tends to matter. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like, um, like even if it did give like more benefit to consumers and whatnot in like the short run, I think like long run the costs are a lot greater, and especially since like the environment more than anything is like a capped resource, like you can't like go past a certain amount. So it's like you can't on the forest. And That's fine. Take the long run into consideration. I want you to consider consider long term social welfare. Okay, which is longer than an election cycle. Otherwise, we chop everything down every two years, right? Um, this is more of a general question for a special interest groups. So is the general theory that special interest groups are interested in getting the biggest share in absolute terms, or are they interested in getting a bigger share than everybody else? Because that's, I guess, where it's not so rational that some people might prefer to have $80 if everybody else has 60 rather than everybody having 100 because right. they have $20 those, more. Those, those are two different dynamics. Okay, The one that we're talking about is the ab having an absolutely bigger share. Okay. This is this one here. right? <laughs> but when you look at people and their and the psychology of positioning themselves, it's, it's, it's fairly well established that um, when you give people a choice between um, Give people a choice between this and this, they will prefer this. Right? It's troublesome, right? But it's human. Which for the special interest group in that case would still prefer the smaller circle where they get three quarters, even though that may right. be right. So that's so both share. of those dynamics are, are are in concert in that situation, mm -hmm. right? And that's okay. You can use those turbo power incentives if you want to. Another question. Um, okay, so my question is with the and still get reelected part. Yes. So are you just assuming that by benefiting the average citizen, which is you know a bigger population of special interest groups, that you will just get reelected because you're benefiting them, or that you're just going to piss the special interest groups off and there's all this corruption going on and they want to be reelected? Yeah, you have to consider uh, when I talk about elections, you have to consider the di the the dynamics of reelection, which are essentially driven by money, right? So if if you do something which benefits every American to the tune, say you're running for president or whatever, every American is benefited to the tune of five dollars, right? And uh, then, and the logic of collective, and then, and then there's a special interest group, and they're getting five million dollars per person, right? And you think about the problem of election, which is essentially fundraising and getting everybody to even notice that they're five dollars better off, let alone donate that money to you. Hey, let's just share it. Give me one dollar, right? So then there's a, the, there's a, a problem of, of which, is, which also discusses, which is that in the, in the special interest group, they're all, not only do they get more money, but they can coordinate to, to move that money, that wall of money. Uh, it might be smaller in total. In fact, almost by definition, it's smaller in total. So they might have, say that all, all Americans have 300 million in benefits, and the special interest group have 20 million in benefits, right? And they can kick in 10 to the politicians, to the opposition, right? And the and and the, the other the all the Americans only kick in whatever five, just to make this number work, right? Then this politician will beat this politician here. And that's horrible. Unfortunately, right? So you got to get this guy reelected. Okay. And this so this is a very very common dynamic. So basically, basically get them to give more money. So you have to benefit them. In a sense, you know, and, and that's and that's what you want to come up with. How do I how do I get them more money? How do I get them reelected? It's like they can, I mean, they 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 can, they can get reelected through through any means except for like declaring dictatorship, right? Does that answer your question? This is a very common problem in politics, even if elections are not fixed, which is yeah. It's just like a lot of the dynamics of reelection do rely on special interest group support, but in this problem we're supposed to not benefit special interest groups. So that's the This is Berkeley. We're gonna change the world. Think big. Think pictures. Yeah. So with the policy, what if um, like I know like as a politician I know I'll be benefiting them in the long run, but like for now they for like one year they have to pay a dollar, but like in ten years from now it'll pay all pay off even that's greater. Right. So then, but then will I still get reelected with that? If, if they read your briefing and do what you say, they will get reelected. 
That's your job. To convince the public that it is worth it now. Right. And I, seriously, you can use any legal maneuver as far as I'm concerned. Any rhetorical maneuver. Doing the right thing is not really a good rhetorical maneuver, but you can try it. Okay, I'm going to move along for a second and finish up, um, or keep going on, on principal agent stuff, which is all related to the same topic. Um, I just wanted to discuss microfinance. Anybody? So microfinance, who's heard of that concept before? Who's heard of Mohammed Yunus, winner of the Peace Prize, deserving winner of the Peace Prize? Maybe Obama should win it in 10 years. But anyway, <laughs> Yunus is a, a guy from Bangladesh who uh, ironically was an economist who won the Peace Prize. And his whole idea was called microfinance. And he just means small. And basically what, um, and, uh, basically what he, he thought of a, a long time ago is, wow, look at all of these uh, small entrepreneurs. I bet they could use a, a loan in order to uh, increase their business, because they're capital starved. Okay? Another person who's big on the whole capital starvation thing is a guy named Hernando de Soto from Peru. And Yunus said, if I, if I give a lady who's got a kiosk who's selling biscuits and cooking oil, if I give her $20, she can potentially double up her inventory and double her profits and pay back the $20. So I will finance her with a little microfinance. I will give her $20. Now, the problem with a, a loan like that is that you create essentially a principal-agent relationship. Right? You've got the borrower... And the borrower is going to have two issues as far as the lender is concerned. What are those two issues? Jargon. Moral hazard. What's the other one? Adverse selection, right? So we have problems of adverse selection and moral hazard. And when you're giving, a 20, when you're giving somebody a $20 loan, do you have time, given that you're going to make, even say you make 10%, you're going to make two bucks, right? Do you have time to go and talk to that people's people and figure out if they're a good business person? Do you have time to monitor them and make sure that they're booking all their profits appropriately? Yes or no? No, right? The transactions cost of, of making that loan are too high. It's not, you, might, you might be making $2 and in order to do a proper uh, evaluation and monitoring, it might cost you $20. You don't even make any money, you lose your capital. So, the Grameen Bank which is the bank that Yunus started. Figured out how to solve that problem. Does anybody know? Well, like, um, he loans in like groups of five, or like, the women are organizing a group, so like, they're accountable to each other. A group, other. yes, go ahead. Um, so they're, they're accountable to each other, and like it's almost... Because it's like you're using like community values and the fact that there's like a tight knit community where like the women like don't want to because if like one person doesn't pay then it hurts like the rest of the group so it's like okay so let's stop there and go over what happens so basically what Grameen Bank did is they and I'm not sure if they were the first but they're certainly the most famous for this is they did what's called group lending and it turns out that this idea is a very old idea there's this um uh, in some cultures what will happen is you get you know, you get ten of your friends together, and every month somebody put everybody puts in ten bucks, and every and every ten months you get the hundred and twenty dollars, right? So it's kind of a, a forced saving scheme. Group lending, um, so that you're you're past, you're essentially giving liquidity to each person turn by turns, because it turns out that ten dollars a month is not nearly as handy as having hundred and twenty bucks all at once. Okay, group lending works a slightly different way. You get five people that are joint, jointly liable for the loan. Now the key is that these five people are self-selected. So if you want a loan from the Grameen Bank, you say, uh, I'm here with four of my friends, all of us are going to apply for this loan. And all of us are going to guarantee repayment of this loan. And if we do not repay this loan, we know that we will not be able to get another loan ever from this bank. Okay? So what happens when you have 
What happens as far as adverse selection is concerned? How does this fix adverse selection? Think about if you yourself were in this situation. Well, who would you go to the bank with if you were doing a, if you were getting a loan? The people you trust the most. The people you trust the most, right? Are you going to go with your deadbeat friend who forgot to pay you back four weeks in a row for the bar tab? No, right? They're still your friend, but they're not getting a loan with you, right? So this fixes the problem of adverse selection. And then what happens in terms of repaying that loan? Sorry? Your friends give you pressure to pay back the loan. Friends will kill you, right? Like the loan officer can't kill you, but your friends can't, right? So there's going to be like, you know, I'm sure there's like a Facebook app, app called Pay Me Back, right? Pay Me Back, Pay Me Back, Pay Me Back, right? So they've got moral hazard taken care of because the friends are all monitoring each other, right? If you've got that little kiosk and you're like uh, taking every other thing of oil home and all your friends are like, well, it looks like you're selling a lot of oil. It's like, no, actually, I'm just making a lot of french fries. Boy, they're yummy. Thank God that you pledged your money on my French fry eating, right? Those, your friends are going to get on your ass, right? So this is, these are the two key components of group lending. It did not hurt that Yunus, uh, the, the Grameen Bank emphasizes loans to women. As is true almost all of the time in development economics, trusting women is a much smarter idea than trusting men, right? Because the men, they get the money, they're like, oh, party, let's go drinking, right? And the women are like, they got to take care of themselves and the kids and all kinds of stuff, right? So the, 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 big, the big one was the group lending. A secondary benefit is, is running these loans to groups of women. They don't discriminate based on gender, but they, they targeted women. And it turns out that phase two of the Grameen Bank is actually, it's not that people need loans. It turns out that they actually need a place to save their money. They need banks. Right? And in some cultures, they need to save the money because if there is money there, it belongs to all of us. It's like, like way worse communism than what we have in this country. Right? Like even if, if you go to an American, typical American family, and it's like mother and dad are there, it's like, oh, you got 20 bucks, give me your money. Right? The kid's like, no way, that's my money. It's my bank account, whatever. But in these other countries that have more communal traditions, we're all share and share alike, it becomes very difficult to save money if your cousins keep coming by and raiding the cash box. Okay. Let's stop there and uh, see you guys on Thursday. Office hours right now. Uh, I mean, it's